Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, this is a basic introduction to using I2C on Linux. Uh, I am Luca Ceresoli, uh, Embedded Linux Engineer at Bootlin, and we provide um, a consultancy on embedded Linux systems, on the Linux kernel, especially device drivers, uh, booting, bootloaders, uh, build systems, and so on. And we also provide trainings on all of those topics. I live in Bergamo, Italy, and uh, I'm speaking a bit fast because I have a lot to, to, to say. I hope uh, everything can be understood, uh, but stop me if anything is not clear. Uh, so uh, let's, let me introduce briefly what is I2C. I2C is a communication protocol uh, meant for uh, uh, communication between uh, integrated circuits on a, uh, on a board, on a PCB typically, uh, over short distance. It, it is designed to be very simple to implement in hardware. It has only two wires, and uh, on two wires, many chips can communicate. And um, it is not discoverable, no plugin. It doesn't have many advanced features, uh, but it's very, uh, very popular because it is very effective. Uh, it is a pretty low speed, usually 100 or 400 kilohertz. Um, and uh, you can also find it uh, named with different acronyms uh, depending on the vendor. So uh, I2C, IIC, TWI, and so on. Uh, but it's basically always the, the same thing. Uh, you can find documentation on Wikipedia and also on, in the kernel uh, documentation. Um, it, there are mainly two roles in I2C. So a chip on the line can be uh, either an adapter or a client. Uh, the adapter uh, uh, in red in picture uh, is also called a master in the I2C specification or the adapter is the name used in the Linux kernel. It's also called the controller and sometimes a bit confusingly uh, a bus. Uh, it is the device that starts all the transactions, all the communication and there is usually one per bus but uh, also multi-master is supported. Um, it, the, uh, the adapter has no address. Uh, the other role is the, uh, called the client within the Linux kernel. Uh, the specification calls it slave. It's also called device sometimes. And it's uh, the green boxes in the, uh, in the picture. Uh, it's absolutely uh, normal to have multiple per bus. Um, um, it is the, the kind of device that responds to transaction made by the adapter. And it has an address made by seven bits, even though there is a 10 bit extension. And the address is set in the hardware. Uh, it's not uh, automatically assigned by the adapter like in USB. It's really depending on the chip and it's in its own hardware in its own silicon. Uh, the, the two lines are called uh, officially SDA and SCL. SDA is the data line. It is bidirectional, so depending on the, on the protocol, uh, in some moments the adapter is uh, driving it, in some moments it's the, uh, the uh, device, uh, the client, um, depending on, on, on the protocol. And the SCL line is usually clock, called the clock line. Uh, if you expect that a clock is a line that moves at a constant uh, uh, period. It's not exactly the case in I2C, uh, but it is still the, the line that tells when things should be done, and so it is called usually the clock. Uh, all the lines are open collector, which is uh, useful to have all of the uh, um, chips in, in the same line. Um, this is how a uh, communication works in I2C. Uh, there is always initially a start condition, which is the um, the, the one here, and then uh, it's always the adapter which sends the first byte. Uh, all communication are 8 bits uh, in I2C. It sends the first 8 bytes, uh, which uh, contain the, uh, adapt, um, the address of the uh, client to, to contact, and uh, which is 7 bit plus one uh, direction bit, read or write. Uh, and then the client sends an acknowledgement bit. And then there is another byte, and since this is a read transaction, then this byte will be sent by the client, and then uh, the uh, adapter will send the acknowledge. And finally, there is uh, a stop condition at the end. And so this is an entire transaction that cannot be interrupted on the line. Um, uh, well, uh, I2C defines this uh, relatively uh, simple structure, so there are bytes going in one or, or the other direction, and that's pretty much it. Uh, it. Um, so it doesn't define uh, what you should put in those, uh, in those bytes. Uh, but um, there is another protocol, uh, which is called SMBus, 
which is actually uh, designed for chip communication on a motherboard. It is basically a, um, a subset of I2C, but in addition, it defines a lot of uh, uh, common uh, transaction types, uh, like uh, to uh, read uh, or write a register, for example, uh, or to read or write a buffer. And this is um, uh, so this is very useful. And uh, many I2C devices actually uh, use the same uh, command structure as SMBus. So basically, the two protocols are uh, uh, largely overlapping. And uh, typically, uh, I2C and SMBus devices can coexist on the same bus. And in the Linux kernel uh, for I2C devices, it is uh, recommended to use uh, SMBus commands whenever the I2C chip uses the same, uh, let's say, command structure. And so the, the two protocols are really uh, very uh, close to each other, are very much overlapping. Um, so, uh, let's see how uh, I2C uh, hooks into the Linux driver model, uh, which uh, well, models uh, whatever uh, is a, a, a device uh, connected to, to the system. Uh, so uh, the, the device tree, the device model is uh, made by layers, which pretty much map the, the layer, the the the, um, the structure of, of the devices in the hardware uh, from the CPU to the peripher to do the peripherals. Uh, so. Um, uh, the, a driver for a nice core C connected chip uh, is represented in green. And uh, so in, in this example, it, we assume we have in a, an external GPIO controller connected over I2C. And so it will have a driver. And uh, there will be a GPIO subsystem uh, that will uh, uh, send us uh, commands via uh, this set or, on, or get uh, callbacks uh, implemented by the GPIO chip driver. And so uh, we are receiving requests from the upper layer to do something. Um, uh, that is specific to the, to the feature provided by the chip. And uh, in response to that, our uh, uh, I2C chip driver, GPIO in this example, uh, will prepare a transaction that it wants to do to the chip and uh, ask the I2C subsystem to do this transaction, um, which will actually be uh, fed to the uh, adapter driver. The adapter uh, will then um, do this transaction, uh, doing whatever action, like writing on the platform bus, for example, to uh, actually uh, let the transaction start. And after the end, it will return back the result to the, uh, to the original caller. Uh, so when the system starts, uh, the, uh, the various uh, drivers are populated from bottom uh, to the top. Uh, so the, usually the platform uh, will create the uh, adapter driver, which in turn will uh, inform the I2C subsystem that there is a new adapter, so a new bus, and then uh, the I2C subsystem will um, uh, instantiate the driver for all of the uh, peripherals uh, on, on, on the physical bus, and which in turn will create GPIO chips or RTC or uh, audio codecs or whatever is connected there. Um, once uh, this is in place, you can see uh, in um, <coughs> In uh, CSFS, uh, the devices that are present uh, in the system, well, the devices that, that are known by the kernel, at least. Um, so in uh, CISBUS I2C devices, you can see two families of, of um, uh, objects. Uh, in, in the bottom part, you can see the, uh, the adapter of the buses, actually. Uh, bus and adapter are really one one uh, to each other, there is one bus per adapter. Uh, so we have we have four buses in this case, which are numbered from zero to three. And uh, in the higher part of, of, of this list, you can see the uh, the actual clients uh, whose name is number of the adapter dash uh, address of the uh, of, of the um, square C client. And so uh, inside those directories, there are more files where you can see some uh, information about all of the devices. Uh, so it can be useful to at least to see if the kernel knows your device is there, which is already the, the first thing to check. And also some additional information that is specific to that device. Um, uh, how things are populated uh, into, into the kernel. Uh, in embedded systems, it's almost always done by device tree. So I will focus on that. Um, if you. If you already know something about device tree, you are probably familiar with this kind of syntax. 
and uh, basically there uh, you almost always have already the I2C adapter described inside your um, your system on chip device tree file and uh, so you don't need to uh, declare the adapter usually um, you obey, you need to reference it uh, so 100% I2C4 here and to set some additional uh, parameters uh, some additional properties specific to your own board uh, so in this case for example we set the clock frequency which is very uh, common uh, to a maximum rate of 400 uh, uh, kilohertz um, and say it is okay to enable the device and then for each client that is connected on the on the bus uh, of this adapter, we have a subnode. The subnode needs to have a compatible string, uh, as usual in device three, to be able to probe the appropriate driver. And then uh, the reg property, which is the uh, client address, the sleeve address, uh, as it's mentioned in, in usually in the data sheets. And so it's the only uh, parameter that is uh, always required by uh, I2C uh, to, well, this is uh, always needed. All of the other um, properties are specific to this device. So this specific chips, uh, chip needs uh, those interrupt, pin control, and so on. Uh, it's not really I2C specific. Uh, so the structure is very simple in device tree to describe your, uh, your uh, adapter and the clients connected to it. And there are many more properties, optional properties. I'm not covering all of them, but uh, there is a link here to the documentation where you can see all the common properties for, especially for I2C adapters. Um, okay, so um, in your uh, life, you will uh, pr possibly never have to write an adapter driver because it's usually done uh, by whoever implements the, uh, the BSP for the specific system on chip, but it's absolutely common that you will need to implement an I2C device drive, uh, client device driver and uh, because there are so many models around. And uh, so th that's what I'm going to cover. Um, Let's see uh, an example. I found in the kernel one uh, that is the, the, the simplest I was able to find. And uh, it's a GPIO controller, actually. And uh, I'm starting from the, the end of the file uh, because it's where actually uh, is the entry point uh, of a driver. Uh, so you have to populate a struct I2C driver. Um, which, whose name is quite uh, self-explaining. Uh, you give it a name. You have to give it two tables. Uh, do you want to? Uh, I will cover those two tables later, and then uh, a probe function, which I also will co uh, cover later. Um, and finally, you call the module I squared driver uh, macro to uh, inform the kernel this, that there is a driver, so it will be uh, known to the kernel and used whenever needed. Uh, so these are the two tables to populate. Uh, the, the second one is particularly um, important because uh, it's the one used for device three, and so it's the one that matches your compatible string with this specific driver. So if you have this compatible string in your device three, then this driver will be loaded and used. Uh, and there can be additional parameters for a specific version of the chip, like. Here we support a four uh, GPIO and an eight GPIO variant. Uh, so we have some additional parameters for that. Um, the probe function uh, is the function that gets uh, called by the kernel to uh, ask the driver to initialize and prepare everything about the, the device and make it uh, ready to, to work. Uh, so this is the, the typical structure. It first allocates some, uh, memo some memory for uh, driver specific information. So information that is specific of that uh, chip. Uh, and then uh, it initializes internal structure. In this case, these are specific for the GPIO chip um, the, uh, kind of, of device. Uh, it would be different if it were an RTC, an IIO, an uh, audio codec or whatever. Um, but uh, it's important that he, in, in this example here, the uh, GPIO uh, subsystem uh, will need to call these two functions, get and set, to modify or read the status of, of GPIOs. Um, then uh, Drivers usually also write to the device in this function to uh, initialize it. It's not the case in this driver because it's a simple chip. And then you call I2C client data, which will take the uh, uh, device specific pointer and copy that, put that into the uh, I2C client structure so that you can 
uh, have it back later if needed. And finally, there is pretty much always a call to the uh, upper uh, layer, uh, to the upper subsystem, to uh, inform it there is a new device. In this case, there is a new GPIO, uh, GPIO chip device. And so um, you are calling the, the GPIO chip add to add a new GPIO chip into the kernel. Uh, it would be different if you are creating an, an ADC or an RTC or whatever. Uh, so, but basically, you are populating in the upper layer block. Um, so this is really the, the minimal structure of, of the driver and this is a recap of all the steps that I went through for, for reference. Uh, then you have to implement those callbacks for, in this case, the GPIO subsystem. At some point, the GPIO subsystem will call you telling, uh, please set this, uh, the, this GPIO output or please read those inputs. And this is uh, a simplified version of the, of the actual function in the kernel. So basically what it does, it, it obtains the pointer to the I2C client for, from its own internal structures. Then it uh, prepares the buffer to send to the device, which in this case is just a byte because it's a simple device. And then it calls, in this case, it's uh, I2C SMBus write byte, which uh, sends a byte to the device. As you can see, we are using as SMBus call uh, because it's, uh, th this device uh, uh, needs a, a, a sort of transaction that is identical to the one defined in the SMBus, and so we are using the SMBus calls. Uh, so this is a very, very simple uh, example of uh, uh, sending a, a transaction of, of, of a function in the driver to send the transaction to, to the device. Uh, there are other functions to, to, to do transaction to the device. Uh, there is the uh, this family uh, where the, the the write byte function that we have just, see, just seen is uh, there is a corresponding read function, and there is uh, there are also functions to send a, a buffer, uh, not only a, a byte uh, to send and receive a buffer. Uh, but um, I think the, the most pop most widely used function is probably uh, those to have register like access because many devices really uh, present a set of registers that you can read and write via I2C. And so the calls are I2C SMBus write byte data or read byte data, uh, which take as a parameter the register number and then of course the, the uh, value. Um, there are also variants of this to transfer more than one byte, uh, but uh, you can see all of them in the documentation, especially in the SMBus uh, protocol. There are many variants, so probably you will find one that will suit the needs of your specific chip you need to implement. Uh, but if you don't find any, uh, no problem. There is I2C transfer, which I call the Swiss Army knife or Linux I2C because it really uh, allows you to implement uh, any sort of uh, transaction or even better, any sort of uh, sequence of transactions. So it, it can uh, do many transactions, uh, basically as many as you want. And uh, by default, it does repeated start between them to keep them uh, connected together. And uh, it's very customizable. It has many flags applicable to each transaction. Uh, so an example of I2C transfer is from another driver. Uh, so basically, what you need to do is to uh, create um, some I2C message structure, an array actually. Uh, in this case, we need two transactions for this, uh, for this device. Um, and then populate those with the, uh, uh, with the data to send or receive. The first transaction uh, has no flags, uh, which means by default it's a write transaction, um, so it will send data. And so you have to pre-populate a buffer and put that buffer and its length into the structure. And you have to set the uh, client address. Uh, in the second transaction, again, you send the client address, which could be different between transactions. It's not common, but it's possible. Um, and then you have a receive buffer and uh, a flag indicating it is a read transaction. So uh, in the end, all you have to do after populating the array is call I2C transfer, passing the array, and it will just do all the transaction and get back to you with a return value indicating the overall result. And so this is the, the most powerful call to do uh, the transaction you might need. Uh, so that's uh, the overall picture of uh, how to write a, a driver for an I2C connected device. And um, now let's move uh, 
on the top floor, on, on the higher floor, uh, so in user space. Uh, uh, so uh, drivers work in the kernel, but uh, let's see what you can do in user space. And the first rule about using uh, I2C from user space is do not use I2C from user space. Uh, the, yeah, uh, you know, I2C is a communication bus, which is meant to connect the CPU to some external chip, which in turn provides some functionality. So that functionality will be an RTC, it will be an audio codec, it will be uh, whatever. Uh, and so you should do, use that functionality, the higher level functionality. And the kernel in turn will go to your I2C adapter and whatever to bring you that functionality, which has a standardized uh, interface and so on. But still, there are valid use cases for um, using uh, tools in user space. And so let's have a look at them. Um, I2C tools is the name of a package containing uh, multiple tools. Uh, it's available in every distribution, every build system, and so on. And uh, they are useful mostly uh, for debugging, testing, prototyping, and such like uh, activities, um, uh, which are probably useful for you when writing a, writer, a driver, actually. Uh, this is not supposed to be used as the tool for your uh, real, real usage. Um, uh, many of these tools assume that a device has registers, uh, SMBus like, uh, so it, they are not always, uh, this is not always a correct assumption. Uh, when you run these tools, they will produce this warning. This problem can confuse your I2C bus, cause data loss and worse. So you are warned because uh, I2C does not standardize the type of transaction. So it, if you do the wrong command, you might screw up something or produce uh, explosions or whatever. Uh, so be careful, uh, learn your hardware before just running random commands. Uh, so the first tool that I want to show you is I2C detect, which uh, can, well, it can list the buses, uh, but most important, it can uh, go on, on a bus and uh, try to contact each, uh, uh, each client address and see if there is a response. And so it will show you this nice table uh, showing that uh, at most addresses there is uh, dash dash, which means uh, there was no response at this address. Um, there is a number here, 28, which means I got a response. I got an acknowledge basically um, from, uh, from when, I, when I tried to contact this address. So there is probably a chip there. And then there is a UU, which means uh, this address is already in use by the kernel. So there is already a driver for it. Uh, so you should not uh, use the uh, user space tools on this chip or the driver would be probably get confused. Uh, other tools are I2C get and I2C set, which allow to uh, set and get uh, the value of a register. Um, they can do multiple types of uh, SMBus and I2C transactions, so it's pretty flexible. And uh, the only big limitation of these tools is they assume uh, the register address is eight bits. Uh, for the rest, they are, they are, they are very flexible. Uh, so it's pretty simple, you just I2C get the, the bus number and then the register uh, address, and then you, uh, you will get, a, well, no, sorry, uh, the bus number, the uh, client uh, address, and the register address, and you get the value. And, and that's it. Uh, so it's very simple to, to, to use uh, and can be very useful. Uh, I2C dump is a sort of powerful version of, of I2C get, which iterates over the entire 8-bit addressing space. So it will basically print the, uh, all of the value of all of the registers uh, in, in your device, uh, which is extremely useful in some cases to debug, to understand if your settings have been taken or not, and so on. And then, uh, if none of those tools is enough for you, there is again something called I2C transfer, which is the Swiss Army knife of Linux I2C in user space. So it can also do an arbitrary number of transactions. Uh, it takes multiple parameters. So, it, for example, here we are saying write one byte at this uh, client address, and then this is the byte to send, and then read one byte from the same address. So basically, with this line, I re-implemented the I2C get command that we saw in a previous slide with I2C transfer. So you can do more powerful things with this. It, it could be just to, to test if you correctly understood the protocol of the device before implementing that in the driver. You want to make sure uh, you understood that correctly. 
Okay, so this is uh, a good set, uh, a good toolkit of software tools, uh, but it might not be enough. You might need also hardware tools. If something goes wrong, uh, especially um, you, you will need them. Uh, one of them is possibly an oscilloscope, which is uh, able to show you whatever happens on each of the lines simultaneously. It very, it's very useful if you need to check the voltage levels, if there is any noise, any spikes, and so on that could produce uh, unwanted effects. And um, many, uh, many oscilloscopes nowadays can also decode I2C very nicely. So uh, this is an example screenshot. Uh, I don't know if it's very visible, but uh, well, this is the data line and the clock line. And uh, in the bottom area, we have the decoding. So it says you are uh, accessing address, uh, client address 51, and there was no acknowledgement, and this was a right transaction. Uh, but you can also see, uh, for example, there are small spikes here, and it's useful to do the, mostly the hardware debugging that could cause strange problems in the software. Uh, this is another example with an entire uh, register read, uh, actually. Uh, so the decoding also says you are access, uh, doing a write transaction to, uh, to client address 52, and the data is 22, which is the register address. And then this is the read transaction, which gets you back the, the, um, the data. Uh, another tool that you can use is a logic analyzer. Uh, actually, uh, there, there are software implementation of this. I uh, use PulseView, which is part of the Sigrock uh, project. Uh, it's an open source software, it's in your distribution, and it, it can work with very cheap uh, data acquisition devices. I have this one that I paid like 15 euro, and it's perfect for I2C, uh, so it can sample the lines and um, a logic analyzer does not show you the, the levels. It has only high and low, that's it. But for the rest, it's very powerful uh, because you can see very nicely the transactions here and uh, puts view decodes them in a very uh, readable way. There is the start condition, then the address is 42, and then it's a right transaction, and there is no acknowledgement, and there is a stop condition. So it's very, uh, it's very uh, easy to, to read and to see if anything is wrong. So here we have the same transaction as before, reading a register. This is also pretty um, easy to read. And there is the repeated start here, which is a start condition that happens after another start condition without a stop condition in the middle. And it's used to ensure that uh, there is nothing, uh, that, for example, another master that uh, starts another transaction in the middle. Uh, so it, it's another thing you, you can see from this, uh, from this kind of tool. Uh, okay, and so uh, probably the main uh, goal of all of those tools is to do troubleshooting. Of course, you will need troubleshooting at some point, and uh, especially uh, when with device drivers, it could be uh, in, in, the, in the gray area between software and hardware. Uh, so uh, here is a brief overview of some uh, troubles uh, uh, and how to investigate them and what can be the reason. Um, so one, uh, but first, uh, the, the first uh, rule you have to keep in mind about troubleshooting is never ignore the return values from the functions. So you don't have to assume transaction have succeeded uh, because anything could happen if you have a wrong assumption. So always check the return value. So after you've done your homework, look at the kernel logs. Uh, they might contain some useful error message uh, and so a good point to, to investigate. If it doesn't work, you can use I2C tools to check whether, for example, your register has really the correct value and so on. And uh, if those are not enough, you go onto the oscilloscope or logic analyzer. So uh, one typical uh, problem with I2C is you don't get an ACK and acknowledge from your, your device. Uh, so this is the error message from I2C tools. And this is the uh, error uh, code returned by the uh, in-kernel uh, calls. Uh, so the, the first tool, tool to use to debug, I would recommend uh, to use is I2C detect. Uh, you could just uh, find a, 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 it could just find some uh, response from a different address than the one you expect like the, uh, the next address or, or similar. And so maybe you didn't configure correctly the address pins of the device, so it, it is responding to another address. So you check the data sheet and, um, or, or check the schematics, and maybe uh, that device can respond to different addresses and based on the pins, it's 
configure for another address than you expect. Um, again, with I2C detect, you might just see that, that there is no response from any address or I mean, from any uh, unexpected address, and so uh, as if the device were not there. So maybe the device is just not power, or it is held in reset, your reset polarity is wrong, or it is broken, it, is an unsold, it has an unsolder pin, so it can be all sorts of things. Uh, it's mostly a, a, a hardware debugging uh, thing now. Uh, then, uh, if those fail, uh, you should uh, take the oscilloscope or, or the logic analyzer and, uh, for example, you see no activity on the, on the lines, um, even though you are uh, running i 2 c detect or you are running your driver uh, and so the kernel says I've been doing transactions but you don't see anything on the lines so the first thing to check is the pin MOOCs uh, maybe you have MOOCs your uh, your uh, adapter onto the wrong pins and so it is not driving those lines it's driving somewhere else uh, so check those and um, then you should also check your device tree you might have put your your client under the wrong bus so you are uh, contacted the, the wrong bus and so on. Um, again, with an oscilloscope, you could also see that uh, the uh, lines uh, are always low. So if they are always high, it's the, the previous case, so the, the pull-ups keep the line high and nobody drives them low. On the opposite, if they are always low, uh, that is uh, possibly due to missing pull-up resistors. So somebody's driving them low and nobody will ever pull them high. So again, uh, something to check on your hardware. As a workaround, you might uh, use internal um, pull-ups uh, in, in your system on chip uh, if, you know, if you cannot fix it quickly in the hardware. Um, the same problem of a missing acknowledge, instead of being systematic, happening always, could be hap happening only uh, once in a while, uh, sporadically. And so in this case, it, it's a bit more tricky. Um, but uh, one, one possibility is that your clock or data lines are returning to the high polarity too slowly. Uh, it's a pull up, uh, it's an open collector uh, line. So you uh, might have uh, resistors that are just too weak. You need stronger resistors. And so one workaround to uh, move on uh, before you can fix them is to uh, reduce the clock frequency. So uh, you, you have more time for, for the transaction. Uh, again, if you see uh, with an oscilloscope, you see um, a noise on the lines, that's uh, extremely bad uh, because uh, it could be interpreted as a, a clock pulse or, a, or, a, or, a, or the data could be read, or read incorrectly. And so this needs absolutely to be fixed in the hardware. Uh, no bus can work if there is uh, too much noise. Um, Another possibility is that you have a mismatch between the timings, uh, wrong timings. It's not very common in, in SQRC because it's a slow bus, but uh, if it happens, you could, uh, well, you probably should uh, improve your PCB design, uh, but otherwise some uh, adapters support uh, the um, uh, device tree properties to modify the delays of one line with respect to the other. So it, it might be helpful in some cases. Uh, or as a workaround, you could again reduce the clock frequency until you have your hardware fixed. Uh, a different set of problems uh, is that, um, well, it's something that actually caused me some headache. Uh, when the, uh, you have an unclean uh, reboot, like uh, Watchdog Reset, for example, uh, after that, uh, you are hung during the booting or some device just does not respond during the boot and as if it were not there. And this is uh, typically due to uh, a, a driver that, is, um, th that was in the middle of a transaction and then the, the CPU rebooted. Uh, so uh, if it did a clean reboot, hopefully the driver would put back the device in a clean situation, able to be reinitialized. But since the CPU rebooted suddenly in the middle of a transaction, the device could be there stuck somewhere and not responding correctly. Uh, or, or even keeping your, your bus hang, which is extremely bad. Uh, so one, um, one um, thing you should do is to reset your chips during boot, possibly in hardware, but if it's not possible in, in the bootloader, uh, so you, in bootloader you should just set all of the uh, reset pins of all of the devices on the bus so that they are reset before if the first I2C access and you are safe then in, in, uh, um, in your reboots. 
Okay. Uh, another situation is the bus busy situation. Uh, it, it's actually uh, quite easy to spot uh, if you look at the kernel log because there is really a bus busy message. So it's very clear. Bus busy means that the uh, clock line is kept low by somebody, so the, but not the adapter. So the adapter has released it, waiting for the resistor to the pull up resistor to pull it up again. But this didn't happen. And so it might be, for example, a multi-master, uh, well, no, well, first thing is it could be a short circuit um, if it's happening systematically. Uh, so it, you should check the hardware uh, or maybe you have a mounting problem or maybe just some solder uh, incorrectly done and so on. Uh, so if that is uh, the, the, the systematic, but if it's happening only sporadically, it could be just a chip that in some cases goes crazy and or, or gets badly configured and so he keeps the line low for some reason. So you, uh, well, uh, you should fix that if possible if it's a driver bug or maybe find a better chip. Uh, but uh, the kernel has some self-defense mechanism. There is a recovery procedure which is actually uh, also uh, visible here. So the, the, the kernel will try to recover the bus by moving the lines in such a way that a, a client should interpret as, uh, well, it should move the, 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 the device uh, from its, its status. Um, and uh, it can also uh, be, uh, the, 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 um, the recovery mechanism can also be provided to GPIO pins that it will use to take over the bus instead of using the adapter, it will use the GPIOs to be able to drive the bus in every possible um, uh, waveform uh, so to get your device unlocked. Uh, so it's quite powerful, but still uh, you should not rely on this, uh, but rather fix your, your hard investigate the problem and fix your hardware or, or drivers or whatever is the cause. Uh, another cause for this kind of problem could be multi-master. Multi-master, uh, in, in my experience, is not very common, but still if you have multi-master, then you first have to make sure that the other master is not uh, keeping the, the, the bus down because the other master is typically uh, not under the control of your Linux system. It's maybe a microcontroller, whatever, you have to check that. Uh, Okay, that is all. I hope that was interesting, useful. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, if you have any. Yep. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, does the Linux driver uh, have support for the uh, back and error correction of the I2C bus, the DC? Familiar with this? Uh, uh, sorry? Back and error correction for I2C? Uh, I don't know that. So th there is a uh, an error correction mechanism in S C. Yeah, called BC. Okay, no, I don't know that. Uh, I probably it needs uh, a client the chip uh, implementation. Yeah, both. I guess. Support, yeah. yeah. Okay. Is it? Uh, I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. It sends a large amount of data. I see, yeah. Uh, or, yeah. yeah, sorry, I don't know that. Oh, thank you. Yep. Just wondering if you have multiple I2C devices, uh, like clients on the line, and they share the same memory address which can't be changed, is there a way of handling that device piece by chip select if you put a multi multiplex the I2C devices? Uh, you mean two I2C devices that has the same the same address? Yes. Yeah. Uh, if you really cannot change their address and so on, there is uh, um, here uh, there are chips called I2C switch or I2C muxis, uh, which well I think the picture represents pretty well what they do. So basically they uh, they connect uh, your adapter to one or another line, or they can have four or eight lines. Uh, so they, and you can change the switches based on uh, I2C uh, itself uh, to the, to the uh, MOOCs uh, chip or to using uh, GPIO, it depends really on the, on, the, uh, on the model and this is very useful to access, uh, to, to use this, this, this situation. You have like 8 or 10 or 20 chips of the same model, 
you probably cannot solve that with using only the uh, address pins, and so this is quite useful. It's well supported in the Linux kernel also. Uh, I'm sorry, I, did, I don't hear. So, how would you tell the device tree it, how to talk to each individual I2C client? Yeah, in, in device tree, you will have under the adapter node, you will have uh, the MOOC node, okay. and under the MOOC node, uh, one sub node for each of the uh, downstream buses, and the chip device is in there. Right. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Yep. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't hear the... the okay, so uh, considering the regmap implementation yeah. of uh, accessing the registers in, uh, let's say, IAO driver or so, yeah. uh, how much usable in terms of uh, implementing a client driver with straight away with using the I2C operations? When it will be useful? Like when, when we choose with regmap or when we choose with I2C? Yeah, sure. Uh, I didn't mention that because there was no time available, but there is a system in, in Linux called uh, regmap. Uh, which uh, allows to abstract register access and it can work with I2C, SPI and many others. And uh, you should use RegMap when, I would say, when it provides some useful features to you. Uh, like it can do caching if you frequently modify the same register. Um, it, it's definitely to be used pretty much mandatorily if you have uh, the same chip that can have an I2C connection or an SPI connection, which is quite common in audio codecs, for example. Um, or, well, other drivers still use RegMap, even though they don't have a strong requirement for it, but it, it's because it also provides some extra features, like uh, they, they can expose in debugfs, I think, uh, all of the registers and so on. So it's actually, it's up to you, it's uh, whatever you feel it's better. If you don't have a strong need, uh, it's really up to you. I personally, I think it, it could be okay to use just the, the I2C uh, calls, uh, at least for simple drivers. Um, it's also easier if, as an entry point if you are not super experienced, uh, but RegMap can be quite useful, especially for larger situations. Yep. Uh, stop. Well, one more question. Okay. Yep. Uh, you get the wrong address with I2C detect? I mean, um, oh. it's something different than what I'm expecting. Okay. From the board. So it can be that I2C detect is showing me something wrong. Uh, I don't know any other tools similar to I2C detect. Uh, if it, so the question is I have some unexpected results uh, from what I expect from the board. Uh, I don't think there is any other tool, to, at least not that I know. There probably are, but uh, if they don't work, maybe it should just be debugged and understood why, if I squared to detect is wrong or if your assumption on the board are wrong, which is, I would suggest using a logic analyzer would be better here because it can sample a lot of data with respect to an oscilloscope. So it could sample easily the entire run over all the addresses that I squared to detect does. And so you can inspect, uh, why do you, you expect a, a, a NAC here, but you don't get it in I2C detect. So you can see if on the line really the ACK is not there or if it is there and see if the problem is in your hardware or in the tool. And if you find a bug in the tool, it would be very good to send a patch to fix it. But honestly, I, uh, it's widely used, so I, I would be surprised. It's also quite a simple tool. Uh, it, would be, it could be, anyway, a, a bug in the adapter driver, maybe. Uh, because it's also I I in the line between you and and the device. Well, maybe, uh, maybe you need to shift the repeater because it's a seven-bit header. Maybe the repeater is there. Yeah, this is actually one quite common problem when working with I2C with on Linux. The shifting, yeah, good, good, good point. 
uh, the addresses that I that you saw in all of my examples um, is oh, here for example uh, 28 is uh, the seven bits uh, uh, using uh, from the lowest bit uh, so it basically the highest address is 7f x uh, but in some data sheets in many data sheets actually they are represented in the other way so uh, using the seven highest bits so the, the uh, it will use only odd numbers uh, or even numbers uh, so you have to take care of that and you might need to shift uh, to take the number in the data sheet shift it down one bit and that use that in Linux so Linux always uses the uh, lower seven bits which is different from what you see on the bus actually so uh, very good point Yeah. And some devices don't respond correctly. Yes, exactly. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 the remark is I score C detect uses different commands. Uh, it can use one or uh, a read or a write command. And uh, some devices respond only on one or only on the other. So, you should check those. Have a look at the help from I score C detect. And, uh, and keep in mind the general rule that uh, those tools are uh, abusing a protocol so I, they are assuming uh, some kind of responses which is what most chips do but not all so really uh, understand what your device uh, needs and uh, make sure you do that transaction if none of the tools uh, does them out of the box you can use ISPC transfer and prepare your own transaction uh, or just write that into the driver if you already have a driver a skeleton Okay, I think we have to stop. Yeah. Uh, ah, one question from the virtual conference. Yes. Why is the red value always dictated in the device name behind the I'm sorry, I didn't. Why is the red value always dictated in the device name behind the app? In the device tree, you have the node, you will write some name and then add 28. And that is then duplicated in the right. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's just device tree syntax. Uh, yeah. Uh, so here. Uh, yeah. I, 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 you will find this everywhere, not only in I2C. The same address is here and there. So basically, the reg one is the one that is used uh, really by, by the kernel code. And the at 28 here is, I think it's only a convention. It is nice when you read it in, in CSFS, for example, or in the bug, uh, the bug logging. Uh, it's informative, but I don't think it really has any active role, or, but I'm not really a device tree expert. The, it's required by the specification, by device tree. It's mandatory by the specification? Your bus is numbered, it's like register map, it needs to have okay. certain address. Okay, so it, it needs it, to match the first reg program. All right. Yeah. So it, it, by the specification of well, device three, it has to to be like that. So it doesn't provide any feature, but you have to do that. that yeah. yeah. What does the make the name unique? Oh. Yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, uh, it also makes the name unique. You, there are other te techniques to do that, but this is one, and it's uh, it works. Yeah, sure. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good lunch.